Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 24th meeting of 2018. We have no apologies. Agenda item one is the decision on taking business in private. Uh, this is uh, an item about consideration of our approach to statutory instruments related to the European Union Withdrawal Act and there is a certain protocol that has been laid down by the government to ensure that we scrutinise these effectively. Um, so just as we approach new legislation um, and decide which witnesses and have a discussion in private, a full discussion. Uh, that's the reason really for holding this one in private. So I believe the very first of these instruments that have come to the Parliament. So we want to make sure that we totally understand um, exactly how they're going to work. Are we agreed to take that item in private? Okay. We are agreed, thank you. Agenda item two um, is our evidence session on post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. And I welcome Councillor Ross Vetres Treno. Treno, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> Vetriano, but he's an artist yeah, with money and talent. Yeah, I was really tempted to do that. <laughs> I've got neither. Okay. <laughs> Um, convener of uh, Environment, Protective Services and Community Safety Committee, Fife Council, Yvonne Beresford, Policy and Programme Manager, West Lothian Council, and Chief Superintendent, Superintendent Campbell Thompson, Divisional Commander, A Division Police Scotland. Can I thank all the witnesses for providing written e evidence, especially those who did so at very short notice. The committee really appreciates that. Um, I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And we now move to questions, starting with John Finney. Good morning, panel, and thanks for, for, for your contributions. I want to ask about a word that peppers a lot of our conversations here, and, and the word is local, and the extent to which local policing maybe means different things for different people in its application. I wonder if you comment on that, please. I'm happy, Mr. Finney, to, to make a start on that, if that's all right. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the term um, local policing is absolutely um, embedded in what we do. And I think since the Police and the Fire and Reform Act has come in, that is even more so. Um, in North, uh, North East Division, which covers the, the former Grampian um, area, um, we have local policing teams. That has been the policing model that we've adopted. Um, and that, that prior to Police Scotland being formed and that we've continued with. I think there's a real strength in that. That's the local officers who are in the area dealing with the local issues, be that be crime or, in fact, preventative measures or partnership issues. And I think there's been a real strength in that. I hear much about the term localism, but for me, there's absolutely no question that local policing is absolutely rooted in communities. And there's a further strength to that for me, and that's the relationship that we have with partners on a strategic, a tactical and an operational level, which I think is as strong as it's ever been. And, and just to clarify before going to that, do, do you understand that term to perhaps have changed in Mr Thompson from pre-Police Scotland days in any, any meaningful way? I, I think the term local policing has changed simply because when Police Scotland was formed, local policing was the name that was adopted to one of the, one of the divisions, the local policing division, as opposed to it being one of the legacy forces. But in actual fact, that's just a change of name. The policing model, certainly in the North East, and I would suggest in the Highlands and Islands, still adopt that same um, local policing embedded near communities. I appreciate there's a different model in some of the other um, divisions, um, which is more bespoke to their needs, which can have a local element, definitely a local embedded element, but can have community-based officers and response officers. Okay. I, would, I would concur with that. I think um, for West Lothian Council, certainly a local, localism um, will re reflect officers that are attending calls and community issues within West Lothian, which would be, for us, which would be known as F Division. The J Division um, is, is, a, is the wider division of which our resources are shared. So um, we still think of our local issues as to ourselves within West Lothian and, and, and not encompassing um, the, the other local authority areas. To to the local community, local policing means that when they pick up the phone and want to speak to the police, they're able to do so and they expect an immediate response, which just isn't going to happen. And the, the communities that we serve don't seem to understand the, 
depth of the, the pressures that are on the, on the police service. They don't seem to understand that when, got, when the police have a call for antisocial behaviour, that they may also have another call for a stabbing or, or a serious injury or, or a fatal accident. And it's a question of priorities. And a complaint that I get frequently as an elected member is, no point phoning the police, it doesn't do any good. And you try to reassure people that they must always phone the police, always phone the police. And if, it's not, if the police can't respond, let the police decide that, not the community. Um, I don't think it, this might be a consequence of simply reducing budgets, but the expectation of the community on the police and other services, the fire service as well, is increasing all of the time. And we as a society don't have the resources to meet uh, the, these expectations. And I think we can do more to explain the limitations that are upon our, our, our protective services. Okay. I wonder, uh, could I ask Mr Thompson, uh, Ms Berifer talked there about sharing local policing. Is that a resource that in common with specialist services is shared? And to what extent would scrutiny bodies have a say in the, the, the degree to which uh, local policing is shared? Okay. Um, as you know, um, as the divisional commander, I prepare a, a local policing plan. Um, I have three local authority areas, um, which is very heavily weighed, I would have to say, towards the Community Empowerment Act and sharing um, the, the, the whole partnership approach to problem solving. Um, as far as presenting our um, performance in relation to that, we do that on a six monthly basis. But then interspersed with that before scrutiny board, we bring to them um, thematic reports, for example, on roads policing, which is a separate division within Police Scotland. But albeit it's a separate division and a national division, it's very much embedded in local communities. In fact, in, in the communities in the North East, it's one of the you know, most significant priorities that people always bring up about um, road safety. So it's absolutely right that they're represented. And albeit it's covered within the local policing plan, they're not local policing officers. They're part of a separate national division, but most definitely they're embedded locally, performing locally and, and delivering that priority. No, I, I get that, but, but the, the actual local policing officers, the, the policing division, is that a resource that can be shared across divisions? I imagine it's shared within, but... Yeah, I think for events, for example, um, so we've had many events over the, the summer. There are many events in the North East itself, including football matches and other events, and where there's a requirement to flex resource across for those special events, then that takes place, yes. Because you mentioned that term, Ms. Berford, uh, and is sharing not a two-way thing, or are you concerned that the sharing sees a removal of officers? Yes, the um, Police Scotland have a number of um, officers that they'll have for that cover West Lothian, but they're based within J Division. So these officers will cover um, East and Mid Lothian, um, the borders, and West Lothian. Um, the we will have a number dedicated to West Lothian um, area, but those um, numbers are not shared um, from Police Scotland. Um, we, we, we do need, or it would be nice if we had clarity on what um, we could expect for a local policing number to be, um, but we don't have that um, as such locally. Is there an explanation why you don't have it? Surely that will impact on your ability as a scrutiny body to determine local priorities for us. It's, it's been requested, but we haven't had that um, information provided. Um, the information from Police Scotland is that they will risk assess on a daily basis the need across the larger division, and they will assess and, and place their resources accordingly so that each of the communities have... Um, resources to meet the highest demand um, and we don't have further information locally for that. Okay, thank you very much. But does that make it difficult to plan for the future then if uh, on a day-to-day -day basis you really don't know what you can rely on in it, terms it, of numbers? Yes, it does and, and also um, for interaction with communities who are, who are asking us about policing numbers and staffing levels yeah. and when we've got changes in services, as a partnership we're working together to um, and, and we work well together in West Lothian and um, we want to maintain that and, and making plans and going ahead. Um, we make the plans um, and we just have to work around 
the outcomes of the resourcing level. So, um, for instance, um, at a daily tasking meeting, if we're reviewing the previous um, incidents, say for antisocial behaviour, which is one of the areas that I cover, um, we will look to see where we can put partnership, partnership um, in place in order to make sure we're using best resources um, communities get the quickest response and targeted frame from the service that gives the best provision. This early intervention can often be crucial um, to prevent escalation and further incidents of further victims. Um, if Police Scotland have met either through um, a reduced resource level or because the demand for resourcing um, has, has outstretched their availability to attend these um, incidents, then we can, as a partnership, then act to see what's next to happen until the police get to the initial incident and, and take that initial report. So, um, but it's very difficult for us. To, we cannot make that assessment. We cannot see whether it's because there's been other um, more serious incidents within our local area or whether that demand has been met elsewhere within the bigger division. Um, we're just told whether the, the job's been attended, still outstanding. And as a partnership, we work around that and do the best we can, monitoring the situation and getting that information to the communities as quickly as we can do it. Um, it doesn't stop the partnership working, but it does mean that we are wholly reflective on how quickly the Police Scotland can react. Mm -hmm. And if it's um, stopping preventative measures um, by not having that knowledge, then clearly that's something that should be looked at. Yeah. It would be very helpful, yes. Yeah. Liam MacArthur, then Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Kavi. Good morning. I just wanted to follow up with Chief Superintendent uh, Thompson, a, a point made by uh, Councillor Vachano there, who, who talked about the tension arising from um, the resources at the disposal of Police Scotland and the expectation of, of communities. And that tension, I suppose, has always been there. But is, is there a feeling that um, it is coming to starker relief over recent years, either as a, re as a result of the restructuring that's taken place within policing or as a result of, of um, the way in which Police Scotland manages the resources it has at its disposal? Has that, has that process of prioritisation changed at a local level or indeed at a national level? Thank you for your question. The police numbers for North East Division, and I would have to say that North East Division would be the only division which has amalgamated two divisions since Police Scotland um, has, has started. Those numbers have, by and large, of local policing officers have remained the same. Um, so I, I think we need to be very, very clear that that's the case. I, I would suggest, too, since the um, Police and Fire Reform Act in 2012, there's been a number of other changes that have come into being, not least the Community Empowerment Act, which I very much welcome, um, which has given us an opportunity to be smarter and wiser in relation to how we deploy our resources. Police Scotland are not the only organisation who are always challenged to meet that demand round about, uh, sorry, to meet a demand and to prioritise, as the councillor has said, um, where their resources go to the greatest threat, risk and harm. That's always been the case. However, I do think that there are opportunities now, and I would disagree with, with, with um, Ms Berriford in relation to the availability of resource for preventative measures. We have embedded officers um, working in partnership with local authorities, for example, through priority families, which are preventative measures um, tackling um, that very much early intervention. So at, the, at one level, we're working absolutely committing resource to partnership. At another level, we're committing resource to some of the more serious threats, for example, counter-terrorism and cyber. And from that, you have a pool of resource that you have to make the best use of according to the greatest threat, harm and risk that you face in the communities. I've been in the police for 28 years and we, we have always faced that dilemma as to where best to put your resource. However, I would suggest that Police Scotland have never been better through the processes that they've embraced in relation to actually putting that resource at the right place and at the right time, and that the preventative measures are actually working to take away some of the demand. And I would suggest, and I can only speak again from my own division, that look at some of the statistics in relation to performance, which are a are but one reflection of um, keeping communities safe, that crime continues to fall and detection rates continue to rise. 
It's a challenge. I make absolutely no bones about it. Officers are challenged every single day, as, as they are special constables and, and um, police staff as well. However, I would suggest that they deliver an excellent service. Councillor Trainer, you raised the issue. I, I mean, in your experience, is that issue of, of, of communities feeling that it's not worth making the call got better, got worse, remained the same? Um, I think it's pretty much remained the same over the past few years. Um, and it's a constant, it's, it's, it's repeat, that concern is repeated by, by the community. And, and that's a worrying thing because we as a society are doing nothing to, 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 to change that. I, I would like to touch on partnership working, if I may. Um, in P Division, they get roughly 10, 11 calls every day about missing persons. These persons aren't missing at all. And some of them have, have repeatedly gone, quote, gone missing, unquote. And we need to work more closely with social work, for example, because this is not a police issue. This is a social work issue. And if, if a police officer has got to address a missing person who really isn't missing at all, but just wandered off again because perhaps suffering from dementia, th then this is an unnecessary drain on police time. Um, they're well trained and expert in the, in the things that they do, but they're not particularly well trained in social work, I, I would venture. Um, so we need to, to look at the way we're, we're working with partners and, uh, uh, so that we're spending the resources that we've got are, are, are being best, best targeted. Um, I, I'm just thinking of the statistics. You know, the, the, there's over 300 calls a day uh, made to P Division and more than half of them have nothing to do with crime at all. Um, we need to try and sort these out and get these calls directed to the resources that can, that can best address them um, so that the, the police service is doing what the police service do, does best. It's certainly a, a, an issue that's been raised in the subcommittee where the police are responders of last resort and, and therefore it could be a mental health issue, etc. So I entirely take your point, Councillor uh, Veterano. Yeah. Like all the public services wants to do the very, very best that it can, and it doesn't want to turn anybody away. But I think that the temptation to help, you, you know, sh should be tempered by the fact that somebody else better placed to do this. And we as a society have got to get our resources organised so that these other specialist resources are readily available. Okay. Daniel Johnson. I mean, in, in part, my, my, my supplementary has been partially answered, but I think it would be worth asking anyway. I mean, uh, uh, Councillor Vertrino, you, you, you were saying that there's been an increase in demand. I, I'm just wondering if you might be able to characterise what you think the components of that increase are. I mean, is it people placing higher expectations on the police? Is it increased levels of uh, issues from the general public? Or, or is it kind of withdrawal of services and then the police having to compensate? Or, just one, or, or some, something else? I mean, how would you describe that increased demand? And, and with the other panellists, I'd, I'd be interested in your reflections on what Mr Vitrino says. I think public expectation is increasing all of the time. There's absolutely no doubt about that in my mind. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of improvements that have taken place, uh, both in the police and, and the fire service, um, which have got little to do with the, with the Police uh, Fire and Reform Act of 2012. I mean, recorded crime, certainly in P Division, is falling all of the time. But the, the number of calls that police are having to address is increasing all of the time. So I, 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 I can't find, there's no co correlation between them. I can't find any, se any sense there at all. Uh, in, in Fife, we've got um, a reduction in the, we've got an increase in domestic fires, but a reduction in the casualties uh, of domestic fires. Uh, and this is all because of the proactive uh, uh, stance that's taken by the, the Fife Fire and Rescue Service by uh, making sure everybody's got a smoke alarm in their home. Um, there's been a reduction in uh, deliberate fire, fire setting, or unwanted fire alarms, and that's because of a proactive uh, response again by the, by, by the Fife Fire Service, where they've appointed a champion to go along and talk to people whose premises of uh, fire alarm have gone off in their premises unnecessarily. And, and that has brought about a, um, a reduction in the unwanted fire alarms, which is a huge drain, drain on time. That's got nothing to do with this, the single fire service. That's got to do with local initiatives, which would have or would have and could have happened whether or not the Police and Fire and Reform Act had ever taken place. Anyone else? No? Have you... Sorry. Okay. Um, 
due to an increased demand, but possibly the nature of the inquiries that come to Police Scotland now. Um, a lot of the calls that come in um, may relate to um, persons with mental health issues or they have um, often members of the public are in need of support for different reasons and they're perhaps known across different service providers. Um, and it makes it all the more important that we continue with our partnership working to make sure that uh, a collective, um, collective provision is provided from, as a partnership to meet the needs of the, of the communities and to be smarter about the way in which we do it, which helps to meet that demand so that we're not putting in um, lots of work on numerous occasions and that uh, families that are in need of a lot of support are getting that tailored support um, and reducing some of the possible um, you know, duplication of service provision, um, which is really what we're all looking to do. Okay. If, I, if I may add, I think, I mean, prevent it has to be the, 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 the main word that we use in relation to the delivery of our services. But for me, the strength in that um, kind of Parking the demand to, to one side is the opportunity offered, I would suggest, through the local outcome improvement plans and indeed the locality plans. I think that's given us a, a real opportunity to truly demonstrate Christie and whether we're working along with the, the health service or the local authority on some of these big issues that absolutely has an impact on some of the other um, issues which potentially before were seen through a siloed organisation. And having that coming from the bottom up as well within localities aligned to local policing teams as well, is ensuring that it's not just the statutory um, services that are responding, but indeed communities themselves. We've had tremendous work in, in communities throughout the North East, um, through um, the voluntary sector, through faith groups and so on and so forth. So it's about ensuring that we're, we're taking a different tact. And I think when we first, um, Police Scotland or the, the, the Police and Fire Reform Act in 2012, as I said, it came in, but there's more that has come since then that's actually enabled us to view policing in a different way, not least um, policing 2026. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rona. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, if I could just return briefly to the local policing element, um, the majority of the evidence we've heard previously suggests that local policing plans are working well. Um, I'm struck by the contrast in evidence from yourself, um, Ms Beresford and uh, Campbell Thompson. Um, and with respect, I thought your submission was extremely negative. Um, is, is it a case that, you should, that West Lothian should learn from good practice from the North East? And, you know, You've, you've explained uh, this morning why, you know, the background to your submission, but what do you see going forward? I mean, do you, do you see that situation improving, the situation that, that West Lothian's in? And it should just say all submissions, we accept what people write in and it's your view of things and um, for us to understand why that, that's being said. Mm -hmm. But we very much appreciate frankness. Um, I do think that... Uh, Partnership working in West Lothian has always been strong and it does remain to be strong. It's really just the, the changes that are, that are coming around due to, um, I guess, the reform and um, subsequent budget changes. Um, Police Scotland, um, as Mr Thompson has said, um, put a lot of effort and work combined in partnership into particular pre prevention um, and that's definitely seen as a case in West Lothian also um, a lot of work goes into the violence against women agenda etc and that prevention is there there's no there's no dubiety in any of that work um, and similar and similar work um, my reflection earlier was um, really focusing on officers that are available to attend calls to members of the public um, prevention is um, strong um, the, the local policing plan in um, 2017 for three years um, reflects quite strongly where we are in West Lothian with regards to priorities and sits well with West Lothian Council. And we, um, we had no issues with the, with the plan itself. Um, and we're working um, daily with our partners um, and assisting in its uh, delivery. So... You don't, you don't see yourself progressing to the, the, the sort of model that, that the North East is using in that sense? You say you don't share 
practice and uh, you know you, you will admit that your submission was extremely negative on the police front. You were more uh, positive about the fire service, but on the policing front, you were pretty negative. Uh, so I'm just wondering how that moves on, because if it's negative now, will it always be negative, or is it, is it going to move on? Absolutely not. I think um, any comment that was made was due to what we've um, seen and, and been party to as a prog the progression through um, some of the work over, over the, the last... Um, few years really um, we're working strongly with Police Scotland and we do continually on a day to day basis um, sharing information working well in partnership um, and I don't see that being negative whatsoever I think uh, the comments and submission perhaps related to um, some of the, the policies Police Scotland were undertaking, like the removal of traffic wardens and how that impacted on communities, um, and, and really just about consultation um, and communication to West Lothian Council, perhaps during or prior to any consultation taking place, I guess in um, contrast to Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, um, their communication with West Lothian Council um, has, has, has been better than that shown by Police Scotland. So if you're making comparisons, then... Have an area commander coming to your council, I take it, to be the liaison, like every other local authority? Yes, we do on, on occasion, yes. Mm. Can you just say, if, if all the submissions were totally positive and there were no problems within um, legislation, we wonder exactly what we would be doing, obviously. Um, no organisation is perfect and, and we learn from all the submissions and appreciate them all um, as, as being um, the perspective of, of the witnesses. So I wouldn't like you to think that because something appears negative that we don't appreciate um, uh, singling out why... Um, why these views have come forward very often. That's how we learn more and can make improvements. Um, Liam McCarth, uh, Liam Kerr, I think you wanted supplementary. Uh, yes, just briefly, uh, if I might go back to uh, something you said earlier, Campbell Thompson. Uh, you talked about numbers remaining the same in the North East Division. Um, <clears throat> so, some have suggested that since the Act came in, uh, the tasks that officers are required to do uh, have become rebalanced. So you've got an awful lot of frontline officers having to do, if I might put it this way, back office tasks instead of being out in the local community uh, doing the jobs that the councillors require to be done. Is that a fair assertion? Uh, and if so, can it or will it change, do you think? Thank you for the question. I think as far as the local officers are concerned, the, the number 17234 has remained constant um, throughout Police Scotland, give or take. And, and from a um, North East Division, that would be, be, be give or take. And that's not exactly the same as we have seen um, in relation to police staff. Um, and I, and I must say that it's extremely disappointing that the police staff um, terms and conditions still haven't been um, resolved. They're an absolutely key part of, of my team in delivering um, to the communities of the northeast of Scotland. Um, but as far as um, officers um, backfilling, I think that's the term that you're, that, that you're using, I would suggest now that probably over the past couple of years we've got ourselves to such a, a place that we're actually starting to make better use of technology. There's been reforms, as you know, through criminal justice in relation to the, the whole delivery of criminal justice and the time that um, individuals spend in custody or otherwise. So I would, I would suggest that the, purport, the, the main proportion or the vast proportion of the officers are actually on the street doing the job. But it would be remiss, and I couldn't say that there weren't some officers who were performing some back office functions. There may be good reason for that, I would have to say. Um, there may be an illness or some other form of reason that the officers were performing that. But I, I couldn't say that every single officer that I have at my disposal um, is performing a front-facing duty. And, uh, but I would have to say that even in a legacy force, that would have been exactly the same. OK. Have you finished, Rona? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, OK, I'd like to just move on, uh, if I may. Uh, you mentioned the local policing plan 
uh, earlier on, and I know that the Fire and Rescue Service do, do their own uh, local plans. Can we talk generally about how do individuals, how do communities, uh, how do the local authorities contribute to, in this case, the local policing plan? Yeah, um, th there's been several initiatives done in Fife. One of them was a, a initiative called You of You Counts, and uh, it sought the, the comments from the community on a whole range of issues, principally to, de to determine the, the P Division's priorities. There are over 1,800 native and, and responses to that, which this day and age is, is not a bad response at all. And they defined the, pr the pro priorities for the, the division in general, and there are, there are five of them. Um, the, then there are seven local policing plans, and the priorities, the top priorities in six of them are all exactly the same, antisocial behaviour. So that tells the P Division that, you know, it's got antisocial behaviour as its number one priority, and it's the right thing to do as far as the community is concerned. Um, and they achieved that by not just your view counts, but consultation with people who have been the victims of crime talking to local councillors, talking to community groups. I think P Division, and I'm sure the other divisions did as well, but I've no knowledge of them. I think they did a great job of sounding out local opinion to see what really matters to the community. The one thing they haven't addressed is the thing that I started off by mentioning is the response times to the community, and that's because they don't have the resources to do that. The changing nature of policing, and I might not get the opportunity to mention this later, so I'm going to take it now, Madam Convener, if that's OK. I mean, the different things we're asking of the police. There's a piece of legislation which induced the, increased the age of criminal responsibility from 8 to 12. That must have changed the way that the police can deal with people under, under 12 now. Um, there's different rules apply. Um, there's some powers they don't have any longer. Are they going to depend more on the social services to deal with people who no longer, uh, you know, have this, this age of criminals, no longer criminally responsible? And, and these sort of things, um, I don't know if they've all been taken into account when the legislation was cast. And IT was mentioned most certainly. We we'll need to get up to speed on that. Um, everybody has got out there. Uh, and making the back office function streamlined by doing, the, by doing it on the job. I don't know if that's possible in the police service or not, but I think it's something that we need to look at. Just clarify that the age of criminal responsibility legislation is at stage one just now, so um, the act hasn't been passed yet, but you know, your comments are noted, Councillor uh, Veteran. Do forgive me, I thought it hard, actually. Right. Okay, that's my understanding. Shona, um, I'll bring you in because, Liam, you've kind of inadvertently um, pinched a question. <laughs> or getting into an area that um, we will, Shona Sorry, was going I, to go I on. Forgive you. Bring you um, Good morning. Um, just following on from uh, the discussion on, on local policing plans, um, we had evidence from COSLA last week, which I think in summary would say that, that over the last period of time there had been an improvement uh, in the involvement not least of local authorities um, with Police Scotland in the development of, of those local plans um, and that uh, their evidence was that, uh, let, you know, that, that, evid uh, that best practice if you like had been um, built upon and that the outcome now is certainly in relation to local authorities was better than it had been and so first of all it'd be helpful to hear from the panel their, their view on that. We've touched on that already. There's been also some commentary around the, the ability of individuals and local communities, groups, faith groups and others to influence these local plans. Um, the Community Empowerment Act was, was referenced and I'd be interested just to hear whether you think that has been um, the catalyst for for improvement of of local people's influence of those local plans and i guess what more can be done to enable obviously within re resources are always there as the uh with the the um, pressures um that have been described so um how those local resources can be deployed and the influence on those what improvements have been made and what more do you think could could be done to have local people, um, as a po um, in addition to local authorities, influence those plans. Um, thank you for the, the, the question. 
for me, the, the Local Outcome Improvement or the Community Empowerment Act has been a, really a key that's unlocked a door. And, and I, I truly believe that before we talked about Christy, we talked about partnership, but we never really did it. We talked about co-location, um, but for me, it's integration. And I would suggest that at the, looking forward to the next iteration of the policing plan, I would want it to be embedded within the local outcome improvement plan. I'd want to see it sitting under the umbrella of community planning, which, as you know, has a top a, a, a top-down and a bottom-up through the locality planning, which ensures that there's an absolute voice um, heard right across communities, in particular those who um, are, have, have, have real challenges within those communities. So I think we've, uh, are within the next um, year and a half, um, are embarking upon, certainly in the North East, with some opportunities to integrate local services. Um, Peterhead is probably an example that um, was approved by the board, where it won't be the local authority co-located with the police, it will be an integration of service. So when the problem comes in, as opposed to working out who best do we put to it, then we might look, that may be a social work issue, it may be a housing issue, it may indeed be a police issue or a health issue. So there's a true different way of doing business. So if you're going to do that, you can't sit with a siloed policing plan over to the side. I would suggest the current plans that we have, and I can only speak for North East Division, point towards the delivery of service in partnership. Contest we deliver in partnership. Road safety we deliver in partnership, and so on and so forth. There has to be a new, um, more efficient and effective way of doing our business and for me it's about integration and um, collocation isn't isn't far enough and I think through that and through aligning a policing plan to the local outcome improvements then we truly are making a difference we talked about demand well it may actually be that that's the catalyst that says we're all we're all shrinking as organizations we're all challenged with budgets that there's a true way of doing our business in a more innovative way and um, you know I think the the time is absolutely right for that and there's some tests of change in the northeast and would West Lothian and Fife be looking similarly at that integrated model um, for West Lothian, I'm not sure if we're going to be looking at the same model or not. I haven't really um, heard much on that. With regards to the, um, our communication with communities and with the local policing plan um, that was shared uh, with the local authority and its, and its development, um, we've also looked at um, carrying out different functions in order to try and obtain information from our local uh, community groups or individuals and those perhaps um, hard to reach groups within communities um, when reducing reoffending um, was changing into community justice we did a, a, um, a consultation um, document from the fire service the police service and the council and that went out to members of the public and to specific groups um, where it was really important to get their feedback also so it's about has been um, as proactive as possible and to make sure that we're getting that breadth of uh, return across communities. Um, and I think, um, as, as well as the Empowerment Act, but equally um, the Equality Acts, really just make sure that uh, we are um, really communicating with all members of the public <coughs> um, and to get their views on, on developments across service provision. <clears throat> the impression I have is that the, the senior police management in Fife are, are well aware of the need uh, to work more closely with partner organisations. I, I mentioned that earlier on. Um, and they're already doing that in respect of antisocial behaviour as, as, as a classic example. Um, but we, we need to get more integration so that we've got the right resources doing the right thing. Uh, and um, I don't know just how much latitude... Um, police management have to, to, to make changes or whether it's got to be a national directive uh, but the, certainly the awareness and, and the need and the benefits that would accrue from better working together um, are, are certainly manifest in five. So on that point then in terms of influencing police policy um, which was really my next question about the link between your local work, the local scrutiny committees, your plans and the SPA board um, are you able at a local level to contribute to that policing policy at, um, at an early enough stage through the interaction with the SPA board? And if not through that, in what ways do you think 
that could be done? Um, maybe start with yourself, given you've just mentioned. I, I don't think that <clears throat> we, local authorities, have got involved at an early enough stage. I mean, I'm new to this job. I've only been uh, convener of police and fire scrutiny for a year now. And like everybody else, I'm, I'm learning how to do my job. I hope I'm, I'm getting better at it. <clears throat> but what, what happened was last year, we were presented with the policing plan, which we approved. Mm -hmm. And as I was sitting there during the meeting, I said, I wonder what the chief superintendent would say if I said to him, nah, I don't like that. You know, you'll need to change that. But mm -hmm. he, he would say, well, excuse me, this is my job. You didn't get involved in management or operations. And he's absolutely correct. It would be so wrong to get involved in management and operations. But I think we must flag up earlier the things that we think the police are doing so they can say, yes, thank you, we understand, we're doing it or we're not doing it because. So I think we do need to get involved at an earlier stage. And we've just got a new commander in Fife and it's something that I'm going to address with him in the very, very near future. Okay, helpful. <clears throat> Westland Council would welcome um, earlier interaction and communication from SPA or Police Scotland on uh, future changes. Um, and I think that was part of uh, the submission on the return, is that we've had greater um, communication from SFRIS than we had from Police Scotland, so that would be welcoming going forward. Although it sounds like being proactive at a local level is equally as important. If, you know, it's a two-way street, I think, is what, what you're saying. Absolutely. That, yeah. Absolutely. <coughs> I think, we, you know, I think that's a, it's a, it's a point that's been raised over over a number of years in relation to how local authorities can 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 influence um, the, the the police authority and and the gap that that, that appears. Um, I do think that there's been an awful lot of work to try and bridge that gap. You know, I can only say from from a northeast perspective. You know, um, the, both the chair of the the authority and the, the chief constable um, visiting, absolutely supporting the move forward towards a far better integrated model in Aberdeen City and, as I say, out into the North East. Um, and that um, autonomy being given to commanders respecting our partnership approach um, is, is there. But it, it's not always been there um, and it can still further improve. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, has your supplementary been answered? The moment has probably passed. So okay. <laughs> okay. Jenny. Uh -huh. um, good morning to the panel. I I'd like to ask a couple of questions around about uh, domestic abuse in particular, because we did receive uh, submissions from Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland as well, uh, prior to today's session. Um, and a note from your submission, Chief Superintendent, uh, you point to the creation of a national unit to tackle domestic abuse, and you talk to a, a, strong, a strong and continuing focus on uh, domestic abuse has contributed to an improvement in the safety of victims. And in terms of what went before, uh, Scottish Women's Aid tell us in their submission that responses to domestic abuse varied uh, not just among the eight regional forces but within these forces themselves. A postcode lottery uh, was very much the picture for what women and children experiencing domestic ex abuse uh, experienced. Um, and I also note from Rape Crisis Scotland's submission that in our experience the move to a single police force has transformed the way rape and other sexual crimes are investigated in Scotland. It has allowed far greater consistency of approach, including the training of police officers and the use of specialist officers. I just really appreciate um, if you could perhaps give us a better understanding of what went before and how that's changed, specifically with regard to the reporting of domestic abuse. Sorry, apologies. Um, thank you for the question. I think it would be fair to say, talking from a North East perspective, um, certainly domestic abuse was treated, I would suggest, in a different way than it was treated in other parts of the countries. And on um, the coming together or the forming of Police Scotland, certainly in the North East, we learnt an awful lot. It's so important that we do learn. The establishment of the national um, divisions, I think, has been key. I did that at the start of Police Scotland. I was responsible for the major investigation teams. Um, so I absolutely understand the benefit of that partner, uh, sorry, that um, strength in having one consistent way in which we do our business. From a North East perspective, that's also married to, in relation to, another formed group, which I think is new since the Act have come, has come out, and that's the Chief Officer groups, which have been formed um, throughout the 32 lo local authorities, which are Health, 
police, um, health police and the local authority, and certainly in the North East, fire sit on a number of those groups. Those groups look at the pan public protection across the piece, child protection, um, adult protection and, and violence against women. And in the North East, there's a, a tier beyond that, which is an overarching tier of the chief executives, who is a leaders group for public protection, who currently have commissioned a piece of work to take stock of where we actually are in relation to the, the subjects that you, that you raise. So it isn't just a policing issue, albeit the national um, divisions have very much lifted the standard, but it's absolutely that we interact better with, with um, the volunteers sector who do a tremendous work and with partners and we can do far more. Thank you. Um, I suppose I'm interested in this in particular because the committee went out recently and we, we met with uh, the domestic abuse team in Forfar um, as part of our, um, our ongoing work and I, I, one of the things that came out of that meeting was that um, the force there certainly felt they were working in a much more joined up manner, they were sharing information, they were much better equipped to tackle cases of domestic abuse and to join up the dots from historical cases. Um, but one of the challenges they faced was actually around GDPR and I'd just be interested to get your thoughts on that because there was um, a bit of a challenge in terms of sharing data between third sector organisations and the police and, and a feeling of reluctance because of the GDPR uh, legislation. So I'd appreciate your thoughts on that, particularly, um, I suppose, as lessons to learn going forward um, for the committee's work. Thank you for the question. I wonder just on that, you know, um, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's always been there in some form, but given the new legislation, I wonder, in relation to that specific point, if I can take a written response back, probably from someone who's far better to speak on it than I. I think the assurance, however, that I'd want to give um, committee is that when there's an issue that says that someone's um, at risk, then the information is shared. But there are complexities to it, and if I can articulate that as best I can back to committee, if that would be acceptable, convener. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Liam McArthur. Thanks very much. I think in reflecting that, it would be worth acknowledging that what we heard was um, police concerns <coughs> about the willingness of the third sector to be able to share, but from the third sector a concern um, that, the, uh, that the blockage was, was the other way. So I think something that captures um, that, uh, that slightly kind of anomalous situation I think would be very helpful. I just want to go back to following up, I think, Shona Rowson's line of questioning. In terms of the development of local plans, I mean, obviously, um, in order to, um, to, to develop those uh, properly, uh, a good flow of information, probably both ways, is required. Uh, what ob observations can you make on the way that information flows? We've heard from Ms Beresford earlier on about um, the local community feeling unsighted in relation to decisions around the withdrawal of, of traffic warden services. Certainly that was the case um, in, in my own Orkney constituency the closure of police counters, likewise, the rollout of, of um, taser use, for example. Again, a, a, an illustration of something where a national policy appears to have been, been taken, but the way the information has flowed down to the local community so they can engage in it and influence it is perhaps not um, been what we, what we would expect. Thank you for the question. I think I've probably answered where I think we need to get to. I think to go take a stage back. And, um, I don't think that anyone should underestimate the task of establishing Police Scotland. Um, it was a huge um, challenge to do so. And in doing so, um, there were a number of things that could have been done better on reflection. However, I would suggest that to deliver um, safe communities and ensure that operationally we were competent. We actually did that. And as a result, however, some of these other um, areas, and I've travelled about the North East, including out to the, the um, uh, in, into the islands and the islands where some of the impact of, for example, traffic wardens and public counters were felt very strongly. I think now we're in a better position as to how we communicate change, and we have to be. I think policing um, 2026 makes it very, very clear that we have to engage. And, and you can engage and say, well, we've engaged in it. It's a bit like partnership working. It needs to be a bit more than that. So I think moving forward, we're going to get better than better at actually doing so. And, and we have to learn from the mistakes of the past. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to stand, uh, sit here and, and defend. We got some things wrong. But I would have to suggest that we got the vast majority of things, which most importantly is keeping people safe right 
but we need to learn moving forward. And I do think that the local outcome, uh, sorry, the Community Empowerment Act is something that's come in since the, the, the act that we're um, discussing today. And I think that's given us a real tool for proper engagement. And are you already seeing, I mean, you're right, I, I think we can all have a debate about what's happened in the past and the rights and wrongs of it. I mean, what, what clearly is, is most important now is that lessons are learned okay. from, from that, uh, that, 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 those experiences. Are you seeing evidence that the willingness within your own organisation to share information ahead of time, possibly even ahead of formal decisions being taken at a senior level in Police Scotland, with the local communities which will be dealing with the consequences of those changes, has that changed meaningfully in the last number of years? If I can give you an example of, of, of going to a locality meeting in, in, in one of the areas in, in Aberdeen City and sitting with um, a local area inspector, um, fire were represented, the local authority were represented um, and community members were actually represented in that group. And we were discussing various issues. In fact, the issue that we were actually discussing was domestic abuse. Now, I can never, ever believe before that that would have been discussed in such an environment, but it was open and it was actually really refreshing to hear how much the community wished to partake of supporting prevent a preventative agenda in relation to that. So we definitely are not there yet but I think that we're definitely on that journey and have learned from the mistakes of the past. And, and back to Councillor Vajrino's point earlier about uh, consistently across the board in, in, in local surveys, antisocial behaviour coming top of the list in terms of a community's concern. If the view of Police Scotland is that the priority for resources need to be in, in other areas, whether it's knife crime or cyber crime or trafficking or whatever it may be, um, uh, how do those discussions take place? Because presumably you're saying, we hear what you're saying, but with due respect, we, we, we disagree. Um, are, are, is that relationship mature enough and functioning as it, as it should, where you say, well, we disagree, this is the reason why we, we, we disagree, and therefore the local plan needs to reflect your expectations, but also our views on, 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 on where resources need to be deployed? I think antisocial behaviour is a, is a very broad um, descriptor of, of, of you know, what actually lies behind that. An awful lot of the antisocial behaviour that I see um, lies behind serious organised crime. Um, so we tackle serious organised crime at a, at a very strategic level. Um, through national resources and through local resources. However, in relation to the problems um, that emerge from that, then there's partnership that looks to support vulnerable people, who those who, who, who um, deal through serious organised crime take advantage of. And not only withstanding that, we come together at community safety hubs, as Ms Bereford has actually talked about, where we talk about issues that there may be antisocial behaviour in an area and how collectively can we come together in partnership to deal with it. I don't think I would ever dismiss antisocial behaviour, but I have to prioritise actually where I put resources at a particular time. And sometimes that comes to a split-second decision by, for example, maybe a sergeant on the ground as to what incident is actually going to take. But I think that we've got better strategies in relation to, take, to tackling some of the causes and actually supporting some of the victims. Yeah, and I'd be interested in Ms Bereford and Councillor Vitrano's perspective on, on how the information flows are, are, are functioning at, at the moment, whether that process has got better. We've talked about early, um, early engagement, um, but, but presumably early engagement will only work if the information uh, flows are, are, are working as they should. Councillor Vitrano. It is difficult to know how to bring about this early engagement. There was an initiative some years ago, uh, community engagement meetings. I thought it was a great idea. I really did. And there were several community engagement locations in, in the ward that I represent. And the ball petered out because mm. people didn't come. Uh, so th that formula is no right. The people weren't engaging as, 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 as it was hoped that they would. And I really don't know what, what, what the best way is. I thought the year, the year view counts was very good because it relied very much on modern technology, the internet, and they were getting a positive response from people. Um, we, we need to look at ways to, to, to engage with meaningfully with the community. But in terms of the information you're getting from police colleagues 
to, um, to take forward a discussion about local priorities. I mean, the engagement with the community you'll be doing as a council, the police will be doing through their own uh, the, the, their own activities as well. But in terms of the, 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 the scrutiny role that you have, that can only function uh, on the basis that um, uh, this sufficient information is being shared at an early enough stage, uh, I would have thought. No problem getting information from the police. Uh, I have to say it's very good indeed. Um, it, it's, it's turning that information into, you know, actions that, that, that meet the community's demands. That, 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 that's the trick. And it's a, it's a question of priorities. I'm sure the Chief Superintendent will agree with me. You've got, only got so many resources. You say, that's important and that has to take a back seat. And Joe Public can't understand that. Ms Berford, you cited a number of examples in, in, yes. in your submission. What's, you, what's your experience of this? Um, again, my submission really related to the response resources when it comes to partnership working. Um, again, West Lothian Council in partnership with Police Scotland um, and Scottish Fire and Rescue Service remains strong. Recently, we had cause for concern for a particular area. Um, the community was um, suffering from antisocial behaviour. Um, our partnership analyst um, was able to pull all the information from all services um, in order that we had um, a, a very clear, descriptive um, is issue um, in front of us so that we knew what exactly we were dealing with. There was a partnership discussion and a plan drawn up. The plan um, included using resources from youth justice services and criminal justice um, across sections, the voluntary sector, um, community groups, community council, um, Police Scotland and West Lothian Council, and a communication plan. So the information was uh, relayed back to the communities. They were informed that uh, collective meetings were going to take place. There was posters put up. Information was given to primary school. Um, and um, that there was a series of meetings, particularly to address the antisocial behaviour that was being um, sought in this community. Um, and the communication, in fact, in, for some of the, um, the, the issues, um, there was individual letters put out as well to the small community. Um, this has taken place over the summer period. There was interventions with young people concerned that had been identified. Um, we have had a great success. Um, the issues have not completely gone away. They're being closely monitored by the partnership and they're still being addressed. But the antisocial behaviour um, has it had almost stopped. It's still there, but only very slight. But the interventions are in place with uh, looking at a longer term view. And uh, some of the young people are now in positive um, destinations already. And um, their behaviour would appear to have changed. Um, it's really vitally important that when we look at issues affecting the community that we do so collectively as a partnership, we can't work in their silos. That information has to be shared um, in order to meet the outcomes that we need and that the communities deserve. Um, in order to address these issues, um, we have to continue to work along in this way. Uh, and West Lothian um, has good practice in this respect. Okay. Uh, Daniel. <coughs> Yeah, so we've talked a lot about um, kind of the the, the, the uh, resources and interplay uh, at a local level, and I was uh, interested in looking at the other way around. A lot of the one of the key drivers for creation of Police Scotland was about having flexibility, and indeed anyone that reads Police Scotland reports will be very familiar with the cartwheel organisational diagram um, for, for any local division. To what degree is that a reality? Could I ask uh, Campbell Thompson? how regularly you have national resources under your command and how does that draw down actually work in practice? On a daily basis, I chair my own um, morning management meeting where we review the 24 hours of, of crime that has, has, has taken place, um, hopefully little of it, and thereafter look ahead as to what's coming. Um, seated at that table are representatives from my own division, but also representatives from other divisions, for example, the National Resources of Roads Policing, who we interact with on a daily basis. Thereafter, there's ta tasking taken in relation to 
the Serious Crime Division and the various um, areas um, that it represents on a daily basis in relation to the types of crime, and, uh, crime that, we, that, that we, we face and who's best to deal with that. Is it best dealt with a national resource, which is actually located within my area, or it's best dealt with, with a, a local policing resource? We have a significant amount of events. I'm sure you can appreciate that up in the northeast of Scotland, probably some that we wouldn't want to discuss um, here, that demand a, a resource that comes to support us. Um, we have that resource consistently. For football matches, um, particularly those that are more challenging, we have access to resource. On a weekly basis, we have missing persons, and as a result of that, to cover some of the terrain that we have, use of the police helicopter is absolutely critical. So, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis and a monthly basis, we have access to specialist resources as and when we require them. There's always going to be a challenge as to where the priority lies for those resources. However, in some of those day-to-day -day situations, the high-risk missing person, the roads policing, the football match that's ongoing or the event, that's an absolute given that those resources come under my command. I mean, and, and I mean, what what sort of numbers are we talking about? I mean, I'm just reading, you know, from uh, you know, Police Scotland report, which, which describes there being 3,356 officers available to to uh, a division, and that uh, is com you know, by comparison that you have 1,164 officers in your division directly. I mean, is that? I, I'm just wondering if you would ever be able to deploy 3,356 officers in your division. And, and I'm just sort of, is that a kind of a, a fair and realistic way to present the resources available to you? I sincerely hope, Mr Johnson, that I don't need to deploy those many officers <laughs> no. um, within, within my division. However, um, I think that sometimes the way in which that's done, it's... it's it perhaps is not helpful, to be honest with you. That's yeah. probably, if you take my divisional resource, it's actually slightly less than that, can, can, can I say, with some of the, the changes that there have been. But generally, um, it's about 1,100. But in relation to those resources, I think that's the, the national resources that, should we wish to draw on them, they could be taken to division. I think, realistically, um, you know, it's not going to be that number. Some of the, the, the greatest numbers that we require are for some of the bigger events, um, to be honest, whether that's public order resources or other. Um, but I would imagine that those resources may be at most one or two hundred, not any more than that. So it may well be that that's not helpful, the context that that's actually um, provided to you. That, that is useful. I'd be very interested to hear from uh, uh, Ms Bereford and, and Councillor Vitrano in terms of their experience of, of the ability to have national resource deployed locally. I mean, what, what's the perspective um, that, 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 that you might have of those resources? It seems to me it's nothing more than good sense. You've got specialist resources. There's no point in duplicating these specialist resources all over the country. You've got a central resource that the, the eight divisions that you can call upon at any time. And that, 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 just a, a, you know, a, a good sense, no more than that. Um, the important thing is that that was a change, I think, that was envisaged with the single police force. But territorial policing seems to have suffered as a consequence of that. And that takes me back to where we came in, about the perception that the public have of the police. Um, it seems to me there's fewer territorial policing, there's fewer community police officers available. Um, and th that... That's what registers with the with the community that we serve. So, so, so you're saying that, that, that you, you feel that there's been a reduction in, in those offices in favour of national resources? That no, 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 no. I'm not saying in favour of the national resources. It might just be a symptom of uh, reducing budgets all of the time, and they might both have suffered um, e e equally. What I'm saying is that one of the changes that I perceive since the single police force came in is that territorial policing has suffered as a consequence. Um, West Lothian Council we welcomes the reassurance that should there be a need for a, a large number of officers um, specialised um, in, the, in their own field to be available. Um, we thankfully haven't had that need. Um, locally, um, how that transpires down to us, if we need... Um, if Police Scotland locally need more, info, more officers for a particular event or 
to, to, to help deliver a policy, whether it be for the nighttime economy and the run up to Christmas, that kind of thing, then they can bid in for further officers to come in for a particular night or weekend, and that resource is then brought into our local area, our locality area, to assist with that. Um, and I, personally, that's as much as I know that we've had. I mean, we will have had other officers in, if perhaps if there's been um, a murder inquiry or something like that. So that, that flexibility about officers, not just from G Div F Division, but from the wider G Division, that's where I think um, uh, that would come into, in, in, into play. You mentioned something quite important there, something that has been mentioned me privately um, in discussions about these matters, about bidding in for resources. I mean, would you say, or is it your experience that, that when those bids are made, that the resources is delivered when local officers need it? Um, I really can't comment because I don't know how many times Police Scotland locally will put a bid in for, for, um, for additional resources. Um, West London Council is informed when there are additional resources coming so that we can prepare um, joint work in the area and, and, uh, and, and help deliver on Police Scotland's um, strategy, I guess, for whatever it is that they're delivering on. So we're, we're informed when, they're, when we've got extra officers in our area. Um, I'd also just like to ask, I mean, I think if, if, if the model is predicated on there being national resources available to deploy according to, to local need as and when, and it's therefore important that, that local thoughts, priorities um, and experiences feed into shaping those national resources. Is that something that, that, that um, the people, the, the, the panel this morning feel happens adequately? Do we, is there a reflection of, of local views in national planning in Police Scotland? Which is a bit of the, the reverse of, of Liam uh, MacArthur's point, I think, earlier about information flows. I, th I think... Sorry, could you just could you just ask me that directly are, again? Are Forgive views me. Apologies. About the questions. shape of national police resources and plans. Yeah. Do they flow? Are they flowing upwards adequately so that if if the, the point is that national resources are available for local demand, it's yeah. quite important that those views are reflected up the way in, in the planning of those resources. Is that happening? Is the question? I think. I th I think to an extent it is, but on a number of these issues that I talk about, it's, it's more extreme cases that we're talking about when these resources are actually deployed. Um, I'm not sure that, is there an opportunity for the public to say, I mean, for example, we have horses that come to the football in Aberdeen when we have high profile football matches. And some people say, well, before Police Scotland, we never had horses. Why on earth have we got horses? Horses are extremely beneficial for police officers who are on the ground, who are trying to um, separate a small minority who may not be so intent in watching football. So I'm, I'm not quite sure, or for example, the, the example that I provided in relation to the helicopter, we never per se had access to a helicopter from Grampian Police. Um, we might have had search and rescue, but that's, that's changed as well. So these are welcome for these high level, uh, um, for these um, high risk um, um, sets of circumstances that we actually have to deploy those resources. So I'm not quite sure how we engage with the public in relation to their deployment. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how we do that. I'm not sure if I've answered your question right, but I'm just not sure how we actually do that in relation to those specialist sure. resources. I would mean, just like to put a similar point to, to Ms. Bereford and, 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 and Councillor Vitrino. I mean, do you feel you have adequate opportunities to, to feed into kind of national planning and national policies when it comes to Police Scotland, you know, so that those local priorities and experience are reflected in national policing plans? Ms. Bereford first. I Oh, sorry, I do beg your pardon. Sorry, I do beg your pardon. Sorry. Um, I'm not aware of any particular consultation that would reflect that. Um, again, if perhaps there was a, a need locally, whether it be a yearly event or something that did require something on, on a bigger scale, then I think the communities would want to have a say. 
but locally, generally, if we're having a, any national um, resources, it would be due to an urgent matter, and Police Scotland would deploy that appropriately due to risk, threat and demand. Ad hoc rather than at strategic level? Absolutely. <clears throat> I don't know whether I've got the opportunity to feed into national strategy or not. If I felt there was something that needed to be said or done, I would have to go through my local divisional commander. Um, whether he passed it on or not, I've got no idea. Um, th there is no formal uh, line, uh, chain of communication for me to, to input there. But really, you're talking about national strategy. I mean, it's, it's a way above my pay grade. Uh, you know, it, I, can, I can only give an account of, of what the community's reaction is to changes in the police, police action, police involvement. You know, I, I'm not well placed to say what we should be doing to, 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 in, in practical terms to meet them. Could I just say, Councillor Vitrino, I, th I think as the chair of the local police scrutiny panel and as a local representative, I think you're very well placed to provide a perspective, but that's just my, 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 uh, my personal view. But, but thank you. John. Thank you, Kavina. A question for yourself, Mr Thompson, and with respect, you're of an age bracket where you'll recall that the idea of bidding in for a national resource isn't necessarily a new thing. Going back a long time, the Scottish Crime Squad, subsequently the Scottish Drug Enforcement Area, which was comprised of um, officers from all the forces. But I wonder if there's a tension, and, and this is an actual example given to this committee when we were out and about, um, from your area and predates your time in the area, and that is that for instance, an issue regarding a proliferation of drugs in some Murray Seaside towns, for instance, would be seen as an important issue in the division. But in the scheme of things, when dealing with organised crime gangs and the drugs, it's not. There's inevitably going to be a tension about access to, to, to this. Does that mean that areas potentially lose out because of that, having contributed to that national resource in the first instance of you? Thank you for your question. I think ultimately, if you think of the threat, for example, from serious organised crime or from cyber or from counter-terrorism, um, I, I, I don't think that um, any of those threats, uh, albeit they may be more evident in some of the, the more urban areas, I think that uh, Scotland as a whole faces those threats. So I think it's right that we have a nationally brigaded resource, and I'd have to say probably one of the best in any country in Europe that we do have that actually tackle those threats. They're, they're national resources. They're absolutely accessible to myself as divisional commander and operate within local communities as such right across Scotland. Um, there is a bidding process in relation to it, as, as, as you'll respect that there always has been. In relation to the public influencing that, um, I think there's a difference round about the, police, uh, the public influencing particular tactics, I think, that Mr Johnson is referring to, and the public having an opportunity to, to influence national policy, which I think is absolutely key. But if I may very briefly, for, for instance, the public might influence um, priorities on the basis of understandable concern about a number of drug deaths, for instance. That's not necessarily them involving themselves in police operations, but that would be quite legitimate for that to be an influencing factor that you in turn presumably feed into the tax tactical tasking. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And could I return to the communication um, issue on, about national priorities and how resources are allocated? I notice in, in particular, uh, Ms. Berford, you, you mentioned there's no transparency, no transparent exercise on how Police Scotland re resources are allocated across Scotland. So there may be the bidding, but how was the decision made? And clearly there will be certain priorities, but I'm getting the feeling if there was more transparency and an explanation, it would, would help um, communication, it would help improve uh, relationships. Could you comment on that one in particular? Um, I, I think it's the feeling um, across Westland Council that um, it would be beneficial to have more transparency in the number of resources available. Um, and really that's within a, the, our locality area, which is West Lothian. And, and to understand the demands and the, the, the numbers and the flexibility that Police Scotland has within J Division itself. Um, I, 
I do think we understand that that flexibility is there um, if we require um, a certain resource. Um, often they're there in order for the police to carry out um, what they need to do in West Lothian. There was something last week and that was there and the police resource was there that isn't normally there. So um, we do know that they are able to do that and that's most welcome. But I think um, it would be beneficial to have those numbers. Um, and then we can we can we can then put some plans in place with realistic expectations so we're not expecting things that we know may not be achievable or delivered and when we're working out um, you know future future work together in partnership i notice in particular you refer that um you, the view is that much of the current allocation to divisions appears to be based on historic practice with little evidence it's based on need so transparency therefore seems to me in this communication absolutely vital in order to to tease that that out Yes, um, and that's even looking at our partnership work and where some officers are feeling that they, they would have liked additional resources. So I think their own work demand sometimes is showing that um, in the work they're doing with partnerships. So, um, but that, all, that, to a degree, will always happen. Um, but it's, until, until the transparency in figures is there, we don't know where the demand is because of conflicting demand elsewhere or conflicting conflicting demand within our community, our local community, and to understand um, the demand in our local community is really important to get that. It gives a better picture um, and, and clarity would be good. Right. And I take it others would welcome that transparency? Well, y yes. I, I mean, the more transparency there is in everything, the, the better. But I'm wondering how much meaning it would have for somebody in my position you, you, you know, the, the local police commanders know what they need. They will understand what they're asking for. I would have no idea why they were asking for that particular resource or that number of personnel. I suppose if you analyse why resources have been deployed in a certain way, then when you may come to want these resources, it strengthens your ability to argue in a certain way, which that would be my... my, my own reasoning. Um, more information, more data, I, 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 I think, without that, unnecessarily burdening the yeah. police. Would, but transparency is a, an issue I notice has come up yeah. in governance generally. Would that not be me getting involved in management and operational matters, Madam Convener? No, I think it would be you expressing a view on um, what you thought was needed and noting um, how things were deployed not interfering with it, but noting how things were deployed and per perhaps proffering um, an argument which would resonate with um, the decisions around that deployment. Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, Liam, I think you had uh, a supplementary which I didn't take you for. Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks, Convener. Is it just very briefly, um, uh, Councillor Vetrano, you talked about the public perception earlier on, uh, which uh, I think is a fair comment and uh, I have an awful lot of people contacting me as I'm sure my colleagues will about uh, challenges in rural areas, challenges of policing in rural areas. Uh, Campbell Thompson you talked earlier about uh, frontline resources and some of the challenges about keeping people out there so uh, Campbell Thompson I'll put this to you is um, are the challenges that that I'm certainly hearing about in rural areas a reality or a perception, and if they are a reality, do you have scope within the Act, within the changes that have been made, to address those challenges? And could I ask to be brief because we've, we've overrun, but it's, it's been a good session. Thank you, and um, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I personally don't see a difference between policing, and I know there is a difference between policing a rural community or policing an urban community. And if I take the northeast of Scotland, it is made up of various different communities, and they all absolutely deserve the best policing service that we can deliver to them. We've talked much about um, local outcome improvement plans and locality planning. In the northeast of Scotland, we have a, a rural crime strategy, which embraces a number of partners in the to us all understanding that there is a different dynamic within the rural community and how collectively we can all work together. 
but I have a division which has, you know, in, in, in you know where Mr. Kerr double the ratio of probationers on, on anywhere in, in Scotland. Um, actually, managing that is easier in an urban environment than it is in a rural environment, because it's a huge geographic area that we cover, and the, the demand there can be challenging. But as we do in an urban environment, it's important that we work with partners, that the communities themselves are the best eyes and ears in that preventative agenda. So I think there's a real strength in that, and, and, and we need to build upon that. But I don't see a, a, a difference per se. It, absolutely everyone is entitled to the very best policing service they can get. Thank you. Um, Shona, supplementary. Yeah, it was just Please. to go, just to go back to the deployment of resources, just to clarify if I'm understanding this correctly, because I think we're talking about two things. The first is uh, when there would be a serious crime, murder, sexual assault, there would be a reactive deployment then of resources on the basis of need. But what we were then also talking about was the ongoing day-to-day -day work. And if, for example, there was a rise in drug crime because serious organised crime was beginning to operate in an area they hadn't previously operated, then presumably that is when a case would be made for those additional resources. Can we just clarify we're talking about those two slightly different things. You're absolutely, absolutely right. That, and, and that is indeed what, what happens. Um, should we require specialist resource, then we, we you know, as, as Mr Finney has said, then there's a tasking process that we bid for that resource. But sometimes you don't actually even have to do that because they're, yeah. they're covering the nation. And it may well be that in some of the work that they're doing in one part, it's actually covering your part as well. OK. <laughs> At present, local authorities are asked to confirm the appointment of a local police commander. Does the panel think this is the right approach? I'm happy to opine. I think that um, it would be a, a great opportunity to um, invite um, local authority um, chief executives um, to inform such panels. It hasn't happened in the past, but I know that they're very much involved in um, selecting police, um, senior police officers, and I think that that would be a, a step forward. I do think they have a role to play, yes. I would agree. I think it would be perhaps a good step forward. OK. I thank uh, the, the panel for that honesty and also for um, quick answers there. I, I know there's been a lot of discussion from my colleagues today about the, the, the local and the national uh, incentives, so I don't think there's any need to go over that in, in great depth again. But I wanted to come from the angle of some of the things that have been talked about today already, the missing persons situation has been talked about. Um, I led a debate on that in the chamber not too long ago, um, and also mental health. And I wondered if <clears throat> there could be some comment on if, the, if as a commander, uh, Campbell Thompson, you've got um, the power, if you like, to um, implement national strategies at a local level, and, and not just yourself, but also in conjunction with local authorities. And I say specific examples because if you take the missing persons framework, for example, which has been widely applauded by Civic Scotland, as well as um, the mental health strategy, suicide prevention strategy, etc., um, there's a, an incumbency on everybody to be involved in that, and there'll be different needs in different areas. How do you see that working, and what more can be done to make sure it works effectively? in terms of these specific strategies? I think there again, um, and I already alluded to it, there's a, there's a national strategy or a national policy um, which I most definitely have influenced in relation to how we've come there. And thereafter, that allows us um, the tools to, to work along with partners. Because if, if that just becomes a Police Scotland strategy, it's of, of little or no relevance. It means that we're doing things consistently within a siloed organisation. But in some of the um, where we've taken that to a different place, I would suggest, or use that as an enabler within the North East, is to absolutely work with partners, in particular um, roundabout care homes in Aberdeen City, where we've seen a significant reduction in relation to missing children. It's still work that we need to do um, in relation to mental health. We're not there yet, and we can continue to improve. But the national strategy is fine in itself, and yes, it should um, deserve, deserve the plaudits that it's received. But it's not until that's actually delivered within the place, and we've some, seen some real benefits in relation to that. Thanks for listening. Council. We've um, really had to look at the way in which the missing person data is being used, because for some of the young people, for um, 
those premises for which they're absconding, they may be known where they are and they're not actually missing. We know where they are, but they're not where the authorities would like them to be. They're not back and they're not safe within the dwelling, but they're elsewhere. And it's finding ways of which to record this. Um, so the data for Police Scotland may show that missing persons for a particular area are on the rise. But in fact, we know where the young people are. There are just issues around making sure that they're safe and, and getting them back to um, a safe accommodation. Could, uh, we're really running short, um, Fulton. Is it something really pressing? Uh, no, it was, it was more a continuation of that, that line. Right, because we've, we've vastly... Uh, vastly OK, over, well, well right. I will just finish on uh, the final question, which isn't a, a okay. continuation of that line, which is about the um, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Um, I appreciate that most of the discussion today has been on uh, police matters, and that's because the panel that we've got in front of us. But... Um, I know that the, the Fire and Rescue Service is to appoint a local senior officer for each local authority area. I wonder if possibly the other two panel members, Ross and Yvonne, could comment eh, on how that role is working just now. Our, sorry, on, for West Lothian Council, it's working well. Um, our uh, commander for the Fire and Rescue Service covers both Falkirk and West Lothian. Um, and... Um, the time is shared relatively equally and communication um, is, is working good. Um, the, there is a change of staff um, with, within the ranks below him, but um, as ever, the communication about when and who's taking over the new roles is communicated across the partnership. Yeah, I think it's working well too. and. Uh the transformation, the cons consultation document that uh, was issued recently is the most easiest to read trans uh, consultation document I've ever seen in 35 years, 35 years of experience. And I think that we as a society should be excited about some of the proposals for the fire service, which are, are going to be really meaningful and improve the service and the long overdue. And, uh, well, you, you've got a different perspective. On that happy note, can I thank all the witnesses um, for attending? That's been a very helpful evidence session. And um, I suspend for a five-minute comfort break and to allow the second panel to take their seats.
Uh, well, uh, we now continue with our second panel, and it's my pleasure to welcome Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, um, Audit Scotland, and Jill Emery, HM, Chief Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, HM Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland. Hmm. Uh, can I congratulate you in particular, um, Ms Emery, on your, your position? We look forward to working with you in the committee. Um, I think we move straight to questions as there are no opening statements, beginning with Shona. Good morning. Um, can um, the panel um, turn their attention to the relationship between um, Police Scotland and the SBA and how that's developed since 2012? I mean, I think we're aware of the particular challenges in the, the early days. Those have been rehearsed and talked about um, a lot. I guess what I'm interested in is um, whether you think those issues have been resolved satisfactorily or are, are in the process of being resolved, uh, not least the improvements that have been made since last year with the new chair. So it, it would be useful just to get your... Um, your, your summary view of whether you feel that um, things are, are now improving and what uh, more needs to be done, particularly maybe referencing the clarity uh, and understanding of roles and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's very encouraging to see the words of the new chair, um, well, coming up for a year now that mm. Susan Deacon's been in post, but the words at the start about turning the authority more outward facing and equipping the authority with the um, experience and expertise that it needs to hold the chief constable to account coming to fruition. So over this just shy of a year, um, HMICS has been encouraged to see that the um, effort has been very much put into that outward engagement more widely to the bolstering of the authority in its um, officer team and the plans that have been approved by the board in public um, to augment that team with other posts um, and also to augment the board membership with other um, board members who are bringing a very wide, eclectic mix of experience to that scrutiny of what Police Scotland is doing. Um, and all of these things um, give HMICS um, a lot of optimism that things are moving in a much better direction. I'd agree. I think we're seeing signs of progress as well. Um, Parliament decided for reasons we all understand to have this uh, structure where the SPA is there to hold Police Scotland to account. Um, and I think uh, my view and the work of Audit Scotland has shown that it's taken a while for them to be in a position to be able to do that. We had the disagreements and the uncertainty about what the roles of the different players were to start with. That's moved on a long way. Um, we've seen the changes that the Chief Inspector has described around uh, new appointments um, and strong leadership for both the SPA and Police Scotland to move that forward. Um, and we're seeing improvements in just day-to-day -day working, uh, simple things like the appointment of a single Chief Financial Officer um, with a reporting line to the new Chief Exec of the SPA as well as to the Deputy Chief Officer within Police Scotland. All of those, I think, are signs of progress. The one caveat that I'd have at this stage is that I think we're still not seeing the degree of real performance information about policing available to the SPA that would enable it to hold to account Police Scotland in the way the legislation envisages um, for delivering the strategy for policing for Scotland and ministerial priorities for that. That's still work in progress, I think. And would you both um, agree that the, the improvements that have been made and still need to be made, including the one you've just referred to, can be done within the existing parameters of the 2012 Act? I, I do. I think, I think the Act itself um, is, is fit for purpose, but the implementation clearly has had challenges over the piece. So whilst I've said and, and I believe there's grounds for optimism. Clearly, we have been here before as far as the you know, new chair of the authority, new chief constable, 
new cabinet secretary um, that it feels uh, in, in the past that the, the planets might have aligned um, to achieve the improvements that, that we all in Scotland would, would want there to be. Um, so, so this time we really um, have to uh, be cautious that all these signs are positive, but it still needs to be um, backed up with the learning from the experience of others in the past in order to make sure that those um, challenges are minimised um, going forward. Okay, I'd agree as well. Um, I think the um, legislation is clear. There is now a much better working understanding of the roles and responsibilities of Scottish ministers, the SPA and uh, Police Scotland. Um, I think it took a while for those roles and relationships to settle down um, and that took time that could have been spent transforming policing um, but I think we're starting to see that coming through now um, and I think the um, real challenge will be seeing that uh, fundamental change in the way policing is delivered at a local level as well as nationally that the committee was exploring earlier this morning. Okay. Supplementary, Leonka? Just on that point, if I may, um, the... It seems to me that a lot, a lot of what's coming out in the evidence is that uh, the Act was brought in and then there was a different interpretation of the roles and responsibilities and personalities played quite a big part in both that interpretation and the implementation. Uh, now, given that the Act hasn't changed, uh, you've said things are resolving now, things are, are looking much better, but that would suggest to me that that's because the personalities have changed. And if the personalities can change for the better, then logically the personalities could change for the worse. In the future, you could be back in a situation where some strong, a strong chief constable could be in conflict, perhaps, with a, a, a strong SPA. Uh, is, is that a fair conclusion? And if it is, do we need to revisit the Act uh, and look at clearing up some of these ambiguities that have crept in? I completely recognise the, um, the concern that you're raising there, Mr Kerr. I think what I would say is that some of the, um, the problems around relationships did reflect roles and responsibilities, but about some quite nitty-gritty things. So things like where the responsibility for the finance function should sit. Um, for a long part of the first five years of the SPA, we were sitting with both a um, finance director within Police Scotland and a chief financial officer, director of financial accountability within the SPA. And you could almost characterise it as turf wars between the two around who was um, managing the finances of the organisation. Now, I think it took a long time for the SPA and Police Scotland to work that out. Um, government intervened eventually in helping them to, to clarify that, but that's not to do with what the legislation sets out. In my view, the legislation is quite clear about the, the role of uh, Scottish ministers in setting the priorities for policing, the SPA in setting the strategy for delivering those priorities and holding Police Scotland to account and Police Scotland for doing it. Now, there's always a risk of personalities um, throwing up the sorts of tensions that you're referring to, but I think we're now in a much more stable position around the roles of the SPA and Police Scotland that they wouldn't have the same impact on um, the, the structure and therefore the uh, policy aims of the legislation that they did in those very early stages. For me, it's a lesson about the importance of good implementation rather than a problem with the legislation itself. Thank you. Supplementary, Daniel. You just touched on, on, on quite an important point there um, about the respective roles of ministers, the SPA and, and the police. And you've talked about how you feel that the SPA is addressing some of the points around technical competence, especially around finance. However, that, how about that bigger point? I mean, the SPA is important not just because it provides financial governance, but, but it actually provides a buffer preventing direct uh, governmental direction of the police, which is fundamentally important. Do you feel it, it, it's uh, improving it, its role with that function as well as the, the more technical financial ones? Um, I think it is um, building its capacity, as the Chief Inspector has said, to be able to do it. Um, my caveat would be that I think the information that, that they get as part of the performance framework and the more detailed performance management information that they will need to let them do that is still developing. That's partly a result of the slow progress in modernising the IT system. So a lot of the IT is still coming not just from the systems run by the eight legis uh, leg legacy forces, but beneath that systems that weren't well integrated in each 
each of the forces. Mm -hmm. um, but I think without progress in having that really clear information about how well the priorities for policing and the strategy for policing is being delivered, that will always be an area where the SPA finds it harder to carry out its role. Jill will have a clear view on that as well, I think. Yes, thank you. I, I agree that there are still challenges there, particularly in respect of that performance point, actually equipping the authority with the, um, the means of properly holding the chief constable to account, the actual uh, focus now, the, the new performance framework that, that came forward just in April this year, has its focus on outcomes and the impact of policing activity on communities as opposed to um, the previous um, target-driven model. Um, however, Police Scotland have still not, it's still evolving, still not actually arrived at um, specific measures that demonstrate delivery of those outcomes and what the impact has been uh, as experienced by people. And that inhibits the authorities' ability to then as I say, hold the Chief Constable to account for that delivery. So that's still very much work in progress. It's something that HMICS is very interested in and very involved in, in scrutinising, as is the delivery, actually, of the um, serving a changing Scotland, that longer-term 10-year strategy. We're very much interested in looking at the implementation um, and most recently, over the summer, we've been doing field work into how Police Scotland identifies its priorities, so very much the, the subject area that you've been exploring with the previous panel, um, and how those um, identification of priorities then leads to informed decision-making about allocation of specialist resource and support. So um, we will be reporting on that later this year. Uh, Liam McArthur. Thanks very much. I want to turn to um, issues of finance, but just briefly on, on the, the, the topic you've been covering there. I, mean, I recognise um, what you've described as the, the, the uh, teething problems in terms of implementation, but what you've described in terms of strong leadership, a, a learning of the lessons, could have equally applied. In fact, I think almost certainly was um, applied at the appointment of Michael Matheson, of Phil Gormley and of Andrew Flanagan. And therefore, I suppose the concern that some of us have is that while the personalities have changed, that the rhetoric may have changed and acknowledgement of where mistakes were made um, has certainly been offered. Um, we're still reliant on roles and responsibilities that are very uh, apply to a very limited number of individuals whose personalities will come to bear as well. And therefore, is that not something that um, we need to be looking at quite closely uh, in terms of the way in which the legislation uh, is working now and is likely to work in the future? I very much um, recognise the point you're making and indeed uh, the point Mr Kerr made earlier. However, one of the, the main things HMICS said last year when um, looking at openness and transparency of the police authority was the fundamental importance of having public board, public committee meetings. Um, and that has absolutely happened. So the visibility of those personalities and those behaviours in that much wider context is, is now there and something that I think will help to minimise the risk of um, repeating some of the mistakes of the past. Is there in relation to the SPA board or the increased visibilities in, in, in relation to the SPA board and the way it interacts with Police Scotland? I would suggest there's perhaps less visibility in terms of the relationship between the, the Justice Secretary and the SPA board and indeed I suppose the relationship with the Chief Constable as well. I mean, of course, the um, Cabinet Secretary has that responsibility to Parliament for justice, all justice matters. But the day-to-day -day operational independence of the Chief Constable and then the um, duty of the, the Chair of the Police Authority to call the Chief Constable to account is very deliberately set out in the Act. And that distinction, that buffer the layer between government actually directing operational business of policing is, is very important and, and needs to be protected. Yes, 
um, around this time last year where um, uh, concerns were raised about the engagement the Justice Secretary had in, in discussions around the potential return to work of the former Chief Constable, which I think flagged up some anxieties about how that interrelationship worked. Is, are there any lessons that can be learned from that in terms of the way in which um, the, the, the legislation is applied going forward? Well, of course, the legislation does allow for the Cabinet Secretary to intervene in, in particular circumstances that would require coming to Parliament in order to indicate that intention. Um, the situation last summer certainly was very challenging for a number of the parties, and I think that is a matter now of public record, and certainly even HMICS's own report, that openness and transparency report, would show the, the levels of dysfunction that existed at that time. Um, and I would characterise the intervention you refer to as a symptom of that dysfunction, because all was not working as it should have been. Um, had the Cabinet Secretary not intervened in that particular set of circumstances, I'm sure there would have been uh, equally, if not more, criticism of, of that lack of, um, lack of action, which some might argue is actually the Cabinet Secretary discharging his uh, duty to, um, to Parliament. Just in terms of dysfunction, um, Ms Gardner, obviously there have been well publicised concerns um, from yourself, uh, amongst others, about the financial management uh, within SPA and Police Scotland. You've touched on it a little in your answer to earlier uh, questions from Shona Robeson. Do you, uh, what do you see was the, the, the root of those problems and, and can we have confidence that they've now been resolved? Um, you're right, I've reported um, a number of times on uh, the SPA Police Scotland since it was established in April 2013. I think the rate of um, my reporting is unprecedented for a public body. Um, and I think it was a, a combination of things. One, that um, quite, quite local level lack of clarity or disagreement about who would take responsibility for key functions like uh, fin financial management and financial governance um, with dual roles, um, leaving both overlaps and gaps between them um, and not focusing on the longer term issues of financial sustainability and good financial management that will enable policing to respond to the challenges in the 21st century. And then secondly, as I've reported elsewhere, straightforwardly um, weaknesses in leadership and governance um, within the SPA itself, um, which led to decisions being taken without a clear audit trail, without a good options appraisal, without it being clear to us as auditors what information had been taken into account or who was involved in taking particular decisions. That wouldn't be good practice in any public body, certainly not for one spending a billion pounds a year um, and having uh, direct effects on people lives right across Scotland every day. We are now seeing um, real progress in that. Um, it's taken five years to get there, but I welcome the fact we're seeing some of these cornerstones of good governance, good financial management being put in place. Um, and I'm planning to report to Parliament again before the end of this year on the progress that we've seen as part of our audit of the uh, financial year 2017-18. There's a long way to go, but I'm happy to be able to give that assurance that we are seeing signs of progress. I don't want you to break any embargoes, mm -hmm. but I mean, in, in terms of where the, 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 the focus going forward needs to be concentrated, are, are you able to suggest where that improvement needs to be um, built on. I, I, I mean, I think we all accept there are there have been challenges in the past, but there are arguably um, more significant challenges going forward in terms of what Police Scotland need, needs to do. I think what um, I would like to see and what we are seeing uh, to an extent is moving away from the challenges of day-to-day -day financial management towards that question of a longer-term financial strategy that isn't just about balancing the books in terms of the amount of money that's likely to be available with the government's protection and what it will cost to deliver spending, but how you use that resource to really transform policing, um, deliver policing 2026, and particularly the sorts of detailed strategies that will be required for investing in ICT, for looking at the police estate, for looking at the ways in which police works with other public bodies, as you've been exploring this morning, putting um, the, the detail on the vision that's in the 2026 strategy and the plans that will actually turn it into reality seems to me the priority now. 
And that is, you're confident that there's a, a structure now in place that almost irrespective of who performs the individual roles um, within that structure, that it's robust and resilient and, and, and can give us confidence that, that, that we should see um, a, a far more um, or far less haphazard management of, of finances going forward. I think we've got the two fundamental building blocks in place. One is clear agreement, clear respect between the SPA and Police Scotland for who does what and who's responsible for it. And secondly, um, the systems, the processes in place that will let them use that to make much more robust decisions and much more accountable decisions for the way public money is used in future. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dan, you had a supplementary? Okay. Yes. Uh, I mean, you, you've touched on um, both... You, 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 you're quite deep criticisms of the way that financial management is done and the fact that very basic things around accountability and audit trails simply weren't taking place. It also touched briefly on ICT and future uh, finance. Now, I understand that Police Scotland have just submitted a request for, for just under £300 million worth of investment in ICT, which, again, I would believe would make that one of the largest ICT projects, not just in Scotland, but in the UK. Given that there that those measures, as you describe them, are work in progress rather than complete. Does that not raise some concerns about a very large ICT project, which even a very capable organisation might, might struggle to manage? And I think we don't need to think very long and hard to come up with some examples where that's not gone right. I mean, what, what, what would your thoughts be about Police Scotland embarking on a £300 million IT project? Um, I think we have always recognised, as have uh, Police Scotland themselves, that investing in ICT is a fundamental way of um, modernising policing, transforming it for the 21st century. I reported on the failure of the I6 programme uh, probably two years ago now, um, which was intended to deliver some of that, didn't. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that that set policing back in those terms for a number of years. Um, I probably wouldn't characterise the proposals that are forward at the moment as being an IT project, but instead a programme, and I think that's an important distinction. Um, my sense is that um, the SPA and Police Scotland have learnt some important lessons about how you break down a project of this scale into manageable chunks while still keeping um, the big picture visible um, and working towards the overall aim. And it's something we'll be looking at closely through our audit work. As you say, we know there are big risks in these, not just in Police Scotland, um, but in public bodies across uh, the country that I've reported on before. We'll be looking at closely at the governance and the approach to being a skilled client um, that Police Scotland are bringing to that. So, I mean, indeed, I mean, there is a big difference between a programme and a project, but indeed, I, mean, I would also argue that a programme brings with it more risks, because unless you make sure that each of the individual programmes are sufficiently uh, well-defined, managed, and delivered within the broader strategic con context. That's, those are precisely the, the, the areas where large programmes come into to trouble. So what, what measures would you be arguing that, that the SPA and Police Scotland need to put into place so that they can actually both um, frame and deliver a programme of this scale um, uh, effectively and, and ensuring that essentially the, the, the taxpayer gets good value for money because I don't think anyone would argue about the need for this IT integration. It's just about confidence in its, its delivery. Um, on the back of the um, various reports that I've produced on um, IT problems and IT failures across Scotland over the last six years, we've produced a fairly short publication which sets out the principles for managing digital programmes. Um, they're things which are quite straightforward um, in principle to talk about, like having a clear vision of what you're intended to achieve, making sure you have at the beginning the skills and expertise you need to be able to act as an intelligent client, making sure you are uh, monitoring against clear timescales and milestones for what's being delivered. Easy to say those things, much harder to do them in practice. Um, that's why my digital team will be uh, looking closely at the way in which this is being taken forward in Police Scotland um, and aiming to uh, test and challenge what they're doing and lo also looking at the challenge that um, the SPA itself is providing, which we, we would expect to be an important part of managing the risks around this. No guarantees. We know they're big and complex. We're looking at it closely for that reason. So I, mean, I think in recent weeks, one of the, the, the concerns has been in terms of some of the, the bills that have been incurred from external consultants. Um, do you feel that, that Police Scotland, as it currently stands, have sufficient IT and, and programme management and indeed strategic 
um, capacity and capability in its own people. I'm not in a position to give you that assurance yet, or indeed to say they don't have it. It's one of the things we'll be looking at closely. We'll also be looking at the um, way in which they've made the decision to procure the external skills that they have, um, looking at the way they've tried to balance the need for expertise, which is quite scarce and expensive in the market, mm -hmm. um, with making sure they can demonstrate um, good use of public money in doing that. All I can give you at this stage is my assurance that we're looking closely at it. I would just add to that, um, I was pleased to hear you say that nobody would question the need for that ICT integration and certainly HMICS has, has mentioned that inhibitor in a number of policing uh, inspection reports of local policing or some of the specialist functions. The service absolutely does need um, a, an integrated, cohesive approach to information communication technology. Um, as far as the use of consultants and that um, marriage of expertise with the policing experience, that's something that we have also commented on in the past. Um, there's no doubt Police Scotland does need the rigour around just that distinction ma you make between programme management and projects. They, there is evidence that they have achieved that. They have business change experience coming into the organisation in quite senior support roles and then marrying that up with the operational experience of police officers in order to um, arrive at the, the best use of public money and the best impact operationally. So again, that is an area in which HMICS is very interested. Before we leave the line of questioning that Liam MacArthur started, I wonder if I could ask Ms Gardner, in your submission you said the structure served to ensure that the Chief Constable was not directly accountable to Scottish Ministers, this is the SPA structure. There has been recent public and political debate regarding the former Chief Constable over the extent of Scottish Ministers' involvement in the Scottish Police Authority's operation. On the back of that, can I ask if you're content if uh, Section 5.2, which basically says the Cabinet Secretary may not give directions in relation to specific policing operations, any uh, ministerial direction must be published and laid before Parliament. Is that fit for purpose? Does that need looked at again, given there was a very, um, a very large debate, huge debate around this whole issue? I think it is fit for purpose. Um, I agree with the way that Jill described the events of last year. Um, I think it's clear that um, the overall way in which the Chief Constable's leave of absence was handled um, left uh, confusions about what the position was. Um, and I think the Justice Secretary's involvement in that um, was appropriate and was in line with the legislation. Conversely, I have um, previously reported that I think the Scottish Government was slow to get involved um, in the early years of the SPA in clarifying um, what the roles of the SPA and Police Scotland ought to be around things like financial management. Um, both of those, I think, fit well with the section of the legislation that you've just pointed the committee's attention to. Um, and I think we're now in a much better position for them to, to work in practice in the way that it was intended. Um, but I don't think we've seen anything which breaches that provision um, in the five years that the SPA and Police Scotland have been in operation. So the debate therefore you know, didn't raise any issues that you had any concern with? Um, the, the overall situation was clearly a, a difficult one for everyone involved and it was difficult to untangle, um, but I don't think that was as a result of the legislation. I think it was as a result of actions that were taken um, within the SPA and Police Scotland at that stage um, around the... Um, uh, the leave of absence that was granted to the Chief Constable. Um, we haven't moved to this yet, um, but I think it, it's clear that there are questions about the provisions in the legislation for complaints handling, which I think is related to that. Um, I know that the review that Dame Ailish Angelini is carrying out in that um, is, will be a, a, an important source of evidence. Um, but if you're asking me about the legislation, that's the only area that seems to me um, is um, important to have another look at in quite that way. Okay, thank you. Um, Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, with regards to financial management, it would appear that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service didn't encounter the same initial problems. And I was going to ask you if they could have learned, uh, if Police Scotland and the SPA could have learned from, from that. But uh, from what you've said, 
we've gone beyond that and it, we seem to be on, on the right track. Um, in May this year, you did your audit of the SFRS. Um, you compliment the board on working well and talk about the strengths and quality of discussion and scrutiny and challenge of management. Um, but the, you also go on to say that um, you recommended that, to in, that it needed to increase its pace of reform and implement its plans for transforming into a more flexible, modern service. I wonder if you could expand on that and what led you to that conclusion? Okay. Um, you're right. I think that the two um, Section 23 reports that I've produced on the Fire and Rescue Service um, have uh, recognised that they made faster progress, both in terms of their overall governance and their financial management. Um, and we've seen some of the benefits in that in terms of, for example, the long-term financial strategy they've got um, and their clarity about the investment that's needed to transform the service for the longer term. Um, the area where I think... Um, the uh, question that you, you referred to just there about the pace of change, we recognise in the report was a deliberate decision by the board of the Fire and Rescue Service and its senior management um, to take people with them, both people in councils and communities across Scotland and also fire fighters, um, fire officers. They're working with the particular challenge that the Fire Brigade Union organises on a UK-wide basis um, and that um, Scotland, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, needs to play into that while have, having its own quite different vision for the way in which the service will be provided and will um, deliver in future. I recognise the thought they put into that decision. I think they have had some benefits from it in terms of now harmonising firefighters' terms and conditions across Scotland. And I also think it's now important for them to pick up the pace of reform, building on that achievement, um, but looking at the ways in which they can genuinely modernise the fire and rescue service for the longer term and put it on a financially sustainable footing, given the amount of investment that's needed, particularly in equipment and the firefighting estate across Scotland. So I take it from that, are you confident that the SFRS will achieve the transformation that there, that's hopefully been planned? I think they've laid some very strong foundations, both in building that, that sense of confidence and trust with their own workforce and with councils across Scotland um, and the clarity about the investment that's needed. And I think I and they don't un underestimate the challenges of doing that more widely um, when we are potentially talking about quite significant differences to the way in which the service is organised and the things that firefighters spend their time doing every day. Um, it is a big challenge, but I think they've laid some strong foundations for it. OK, thank you. Yeah, um, you would be aware that in, in the first panel there was um, a line of questioning about resources and the transparency in the allocation of these resources and the reasons behind that. So I wonder if, um, given HMICS has stated there's a need for the SPA to strengthen its governance through increased transparency, focus scrutiny and improve relationship with local authorities and stakeholders, whether that also applies um, to Police Scotland when we cascade down to looking at the resources um, uh, allocated at national level and how that impacts on local needs. Thank you. Um, we've commented a number of times on that link that should exist between the 32 scrutiny committees at that local authority level and the national decision making and a, a, a was privy to part of that discussion this morning about both ways, so the local influencing the national, but also the national communicating at a local level. Um, so there's a number of um, areas that, that HMICS is, um, is encouraged to see, the National Conveners Forum, so the conveners of each of those um, scrutiny committees have a forum, and also the Joint Officer Joint Chief Officer Group, where um, we see um, COSLA, SOLAS, um, Police Scotland and the SPA being represented. Um, it certainly is something that is evolving, is developing and is moving in a better direction. Um, key to some of this discussion is another topic that was touched on earlier, and that's um, an accurate analysis of demand across the country. That absolutely is part of an ongoing programme um, within Police Scotland um, to look at demand, productivity and performance. Um, 
However, we have expressed some concern about the pace of that work um, because it is pivotal to a lot of these discussions about understanding before we talk about any officer numbers, whether we're starting with the right number and whether those posts are actually distributed where and when they need to be across Scotland. Okay. And Ms Carter, you think, does there need to be a more tangible um, exercise carried out uh, in terms of transparency and the reasons why certain resources have been allocated in a certain way? Um, my starting point is that where we're talking about public services and public money, openness and transparency, transparency should be the norm. Um, there are clearly some uh, specific decisions, some specific services where um, that's not possible for good reason. Um, but I think people should be very clear why and when they can't share information of that sort. We're seeing some real progress being made in the way the SPA carries out its business from a default, which I think was um, moving very much in the wrong direction away from being transparent and making it easier for Parliament and the media, local communities, to see what was happening. That's shifted at the SPA level. I think there's probably room for the same shift to take place, at least in some parts of Scotland, so that people um, understand what resources are available, how decisions are being made, and have the chance to have their voices heard. We know from examples elsewhere in health and social care um, that actually that often um, has real benefits for the people responsible for public services in in this parliament, in government, and at a local level. Um, people don't expect uh, there to be a magic wand that can answer every uh, preference, every wish that they express, but they do, I think, these days expect to be involved in the discussions about them. And I think there's room for more of that at a local level in policing. So that's more from Police Scotland um, giving information about the resources nationally in the way that SPA has now opened up a little bit more, well, considerably more, and is much more accountable and transparent. And I think, as, as the Chief Inspector has described, we've got the mechanism for doing that through the local scrutiny committees. It's now about making a reality of making that information available and genuinely entering into a discussion about it. Thank you. Daniel, very briefly. Yeah, I, I would just wonder if, if uh, Carolyn Gardner and Jill Marie would, would reflect whether or not actually the, the point is more fundamental than just good governance or transparency, that if we believe in policing by consent, these things are not just kind of good to have, but vital if we're going to have you know, policing policies genuinely consented to by the by the public. Absolutely, policing by consent is is pivotal to to everything. And Police Scotland has um, has done quite a bit of work about public confidence. So they have a public confidence steering group. So trying to learn from the findings of the Scottish Crime and Justice surveys, as well as its own. Um, user satisfaction survey and actually differentiating between satisfaction and confidence. Part of that confidence comes from having um, good scrutiny and having checks and balances in the system on which society can rely. Um, and um, certainly it, it's really important that we can, that we can all show that that scrutiny is independent as well from government and actually evidence-based. I agree. Um, and I, I think actually policing is only different by degree. Um, policing by consent is so important because the police have got the power to deprive people of their liberties to use force. Um, but I think for any public service, um, they're provided by and on behalf of people for people. Um, we know there are difficult decisions to be made about a number of um, areas of public services, given the financial pressures, the way society is changing. Um, and I think much more involvement along the principles set out in the Community Empowerment Bill um, and the open government partnership that the government's entered into to will help us to make those decisions better and with more public support in future. Do you think there's any structural changes that you could make, such as uh, local scrutiny panels having uh, nominees on the SPA board itself or other ways of com uh, comprising the, the SPA board differently to reflect the public view? Well, previously there, there was a, an allocation between the board members for um, certain scrutiny <laughs> committees uh, across Scotland. And HMICS does make that point in, in our written response that that was something um, that, that we felt to be valuable to provide that um, formal link. 
um, between the business being discussed at local scrutiny levels and um, that of the, the national considerations. Um, and part of that needed to be the visibility of resource allocation and actually benchmarking between areas. Mm -hmm. And that, that is something I know that members of local scrutiny committees would find very useful um, if, if that were more overt and more easily accessible. We've actually gone on to John uh, Finney's questions. Could I ask members when they come in, I'm very generous with supplementaries, but please um, pay attention to, to what you're asking to ensure we're not going on to a line <coughs> of questioning that's just about to be covered. John Finney. Uh, uh, thank you, Camina. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Uh, maybe just to build on that, um, uh, I think there's acknowledged that there still remains some tensions between the central scrutiny role and, 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 and the local bodies. Now, I, I, I note what the inspectors say about the National Convention, uh, Conveners Forum and the, the Joint Officer Group, and I think that's a positive step. <clears throat> I've long been of the view that we should try and devolve as much resource as possible, and of course there are limitations to do that. Um, do you see an opportunity for a more enhanced role, and therefore being seen by some local authorities as a more meaningful role? Because if pe people like something meaty to scrutinise, and the meaty thing you can scrutinise is resource, invariably money, so do you see a greater role and would, would that have a, a, a more gelling effect on the relationship between national scrutiny and local scrutiny? Well, if, if I may go first. Um, <clears throat> I understand that, that, that point absolutely. However, the inherent risk there would be we'll actually replace eight territorial police forces with 32. Um, so the extent of autonomy Well, you might think that would be a good thing. That That is another um, discussion altogether. I suppose what the current structure um, intends is that there's autonomy on the part of local police commanders times 13, each of whom uh, do personally attend 32 local authority scrutiny panels, scrutiny committees, and that, that um, the limitations of that autonomy are in order so in order to provide a national framework in which that's delivered in order to achieve the main aims of reform so that there is there are many more voices at a local level but it is within a framework of a national structure yes for, forgive me if i say if we had an acceptance that one of the benefits was the shared national resource and that this national police force w w would do the very strategic things of counter-terrorism cross-border crime organized crime human trafficking and the likes if there's that acceptance then what comes below that surely there's a great an opportunity for greater local involvement more meaningful local involvement well, what you seem to be describing sounds very similar to the previous Scottish Crime and Drug Enforcement Agency and the eight forces, which actually HMICS, as, as you will recall, have previously criticised. Indeed, it was one of the drivers for reform, was that lack of connection between a national functional delivery and that local um, ownership of issues that affect communities living in a local area. But, but the, the, the difficulty for me is there isn't that local ownership. It's now seen as it's been something done from out with. Now, if, like me, you, you like local empowerment, then there is this opportunity, accepting this very strategic level of work that's going to be done and scrutinised at national level, not least because there weren't people under the previous regime who had the sufficient level of clearance to be doing some of the scrutiny that was required um, in relation to, for instance, counter-terrorism. So surely that can be something that's built on and be really a meaningful part of partnership working at local level. And it's not, under, it's not undermining anything, quite the reverse. It's, it's, it's seeking fullest possible engagement, giving these committees something meaningful to scrutinise. I agree that the, the key to, to the success of reform lies at very much at a local level and none of the, the issues, the national challenges as you've described them, happen anywhere other than local communities. Yeah. Um, and local commanders absolutely do have the opportunity and indeed uh, do take, take that chance to have people from some of those national functions come and speak to local members of scrutiny committees in order to have that engagement on um, on activity that is happening within communities 
uh, at that local level. I'm not convinced that... For the avoidance of doubt, I wasn't suggesting no engagement in that. That's where some of the difficulties come around central direction, around, for instance, the armed issue, which... Yes. ...revisit, or, or stop and search. But it, it, it's still... There is a potential, I would say, for a greater role for local scrutiny committees. I don't know if Scardner would have... I, um, I, I'll start with a disclaimer that I know much less about the mechanics of local policing than Jill does because of our different roles. We work closely together, but we have different roles. Um, I think that, that the attention of the SPA um, has been to a great extent on the national operation of Police Scotland, and we know that some of the benefits of, of that are now being delivered with more consistency, more access to specialist services. I think that some of the well-documented difficulties around policing in Scotland since 2013 have got in the way of people being able to really think about what local scrutiny and beyond that local involvement might look like. My sense is that we've got the mechanism there through the local scrutiny committees. Um, I think we know they're very variable in practice. Um, and it seems to me that would be a very important area for the SPA now to be engaging, to be looking at how they're... Um, working at, right across the 32 local authority areas and within that getting much more of a sense of um, how along the principles set out in the Community Empowerment Act um, that there really is that dialogue going on with local communities and their representatives and how far there is scope to flex local policing while um, maintaining and protecting, investing in the, the national capacity where that's required. I think that's the, the unanswered question really about reform so far from my perspective. OK, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, Ms. Maria, about 13 local um, commanders um, having to service 32 local scrutiny bodies. Now, that's not prescribed in the legislation, so could the legislation be improved in some way to, su to look at you know, if this is maybe a cumbersome, if this is maybe a, a practice that isn't working as well as it should be? Is that an area that the committee should be looking at to, to see if um, we could pin down what may work a little bit better? I, I think the... The system as, as it stands does work, but it does mean that there are anomalies where one, one divisional commander might actually have to attend four separate scrutiny Excuse committees. Me. For example, uh, West Lothian, who were giving evidence in your previous session, is one of four local authority areas in, in one policing division. Um, this is actually linked to another of the discussions about the integrated uh, IT systems because all of the 13 divisions um, boundaries are really um, are, 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 are in part dictated by the legacy IT systems of the previous eight forces. So you'll see five, the other councillor from five P division in Police Scotland was previously five constabulary. So Lothian and Borders, clearly there was E Division Edinburgh, um, which has, due to its size, a single um, divisional commander, single council. But J Division is the rest of Lothian and Borders, so West Lothian, Mid and East Lothian, and the Scottish Borders. Um, and you can see that right across Scotland. Um, it, it, is, um, it is possible for commanders to service more than one committee. Um, it, it is slightly anomalous. I, I heard the um, West Lothian representative talk about the fire structure. So it's obvious that that is slightly mm -hmm. different and, and you could argue that there's more synergy between West Lothian and Falkirk Council than, than there is between West Lothian and the Scottish Borders, for example. Um, but it, it is a, it's an indication of the speed with which reform mm -hmm. took place and the challenge that existed in trying to ensure that operational policing and delivery actually continued on day one. So there was an element of as is moving into reform. Um, I think the um, developments we're talking about today, uh, in particular that, that ICT enabler, would, along with that demand analysis I mentioned earlier, would actually invite a, a revisiting of the decisions of boundaries of division and how those could be um, more sensitive to the boundaries of communities at local authority level.
Yeah, and do you have any comment on that, Ms. Gardner, or just um, to concur? Uh, really, just to echo exactly what Jill has said. I think we've always known that the real benefits of reform would come when we're able to transform both the police service and the fire and rescue service. So far, for different reasons, people have been focused on a smooth transition within the existing services. And until we can start to rethink that with all of the um, underpinning enablers for things like IT, harmonising terms and conditions, we won't get the full benefits. The, the potential is definitely there. All right, thank you. Finally, you touched on the compliance process and um, the, the problems and, and really shortfalls um, in terms of uh, the, the previous Chief Constable. And I notice in the HMICS um, written submission that they'd previously contacted acted on the impact of public commentary on complaints against senior officers and the potential to undermine public confidence in policing. And the recent experience in Scotland raises questions about the procedures in place to deal professionally with complaints, ensuring that the duty of care towards complainers and those um, subject to the complaint is fulfilled. Could you both comment on that? It's a fairly crucial aspect. Well, HMICS very much welcomes the review that the um, Cabinet Secretary um, invited that Dame Ailish Angelini is now undertaking. And I know that she's started to have meetings with, with key people as part of that review. Um, it certainly was a very difficult time. We've talked about towards the end of last year when there was a very public um, surfacing of... Um, allegations that were made against very senior people in Police Scotland. Um, and it is a balance between absolutely having confidence that any complaint or issue will be thoroughly investigated and actually having a means of um, some kind of assessment of that, of the veracity of those complaints, allegations before it becomes in the, in the public domain. Um, so there's, there's a, a balance to be struck there between absolutely ensuring that there are thorough investigations and there is a body in order to, to carry that out independent from Police Scotland in the form of the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner, um, but also um, ensuring that there's, there's a, um, a consideration of the impact of some of that very public display on the confidence that the public can have in their policing service, um, as well as the impact on people who might be considering making uh, a complaint and, and um, disclosing something that is um, sensitive or difficult and would be inhibited from doing so because of that very public reaction. And Ms Gardner? <coughs> I think there's no doubt that the nature of policing means that it's more important than anywhere else to have that very fair and balanced approach where everybody is clear about how complaints will be taken forward um, and that um, balances the needs of the person being complained about and the complainant or complainants. Um, my perspective is that the events last year around the uh, chief constable, um, the way they were handled didn't uh, help to generate confidence in policing in Scotland um, among people close to that, but also much more widely. Um, I noted in a number of the submissions that the committee has received in response to this inquiry um, that some of the same concerns are being raised, and particularly by the uh, the. Perk uh, submission to you. Um, concerns about that, I noticed the same in the Chief Inspector's um, submission, and it seems to me there's enough evidence there to suggest it's part of the legislation that can use usefully be reviewed. And like Jill, I welcome the review that the Cabinet Secretary has commissioned. Can I ask if there's um, a case um, for if the complaint involves the very top of the police force, the Chief Constable, that should be fast-tracked and there's justification for doing that because as long as there's that paralysis then it's deeply damaging to the whole force. Uh, absolutely. The, apologies. The, the more quickly um, such an issue could be addressed um, and concluded one way or another, um, the better. Um, and indeed, I think that is one of the concerns that uh, exists in some of the submissions um, about to whom is the commissioner, the 
Police Investigations and Review Commission are accountable and to what extent can any um, relevant party intervene and, and establish the priority of investigations. Okay. okay. And same thing. Liam Kerr, and that's supplementary. And just on that point, and do you have any comment about uh, if, if th that were the situation the convener describes, uh, uh, an officer uh, facing uh, allegations, my understanding is that uh, if that officer were to resign uh, or to leave the force, then at the moment the investigation also stops. So there's no resolution either for the, the accused uh, or for those who have made the accusation. Do you have any comment on that situation? That is an accurate description of the situation as it stands. And my comment would be that I agree that it is unsatisfactory both for the person making the complaint and for the individual who has publicly uh, been accused of, of the behaviours. Um, and I know that that's something that the Commissioner has raised in her um, submission to you also. Thank you. That concludes our line of questioning. Can I thank you both very much for attending and also for um, submitting the, the written evidence that you did to the committee, which has been extremely helpful as always. We now move on. Thank you very much. We now move on to agenda item three, which is support, subordinate legislation. And we have six negative um, instruments. I intend to take them on block and um, ask members if they have any comments on any of these six negative instruments. Can I take it that the committee does not have any comments and that it does not want to make any recommendations in, relations to, in relation to these instruments? Agreed? Agreed. That's very helpful, thank you. Agenda item four is public petitions and consideration of two public petitions. I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and paper five, which is a private paper. The committee is asked to consider and agree what action, if any, it wishes to take in relation to each of these petitions. Possible options are outlined in paragraph five in paper four and I rem remind members that if they wish to keep a petition open they should indicate how they would like the committee to take it forward and if they wish to close the petition they should give reasons. So consider uh, considering each one as they appear in the paper, starting with PE 1458, Register of Judicial Interests. This is the committee's first time considering this petition. It calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create a register of pecuniary interest of judges bill or amend present legislation to require all members of the judiciary in Scotland to submit their interests and hospitality received to a public, a, a public available register of interest. Possible outline options are outlined in paragraph five, paper three, and do members have any comments or questions? John Finney. Thank you, Camina. Um, I seem to have mislaid the paper, but from memory, there was a number of recommendations about acquiring further information. Uh, I, I would be supportive of that, and I, I think future generations will be, be surprised that we're not in the position of having this registered already. So I, I, I think we need to be best informed. So I would suggest that we get that additional information and consider it again. Okay. Are there any other comments? Uh, Rona and then Daniel. Yes, I, I would agree with um, John Finney. Um, the Petitions Committee um, believe that this register is not unworkable and they, they recommended it. And I think it's something, as my colleague John Finney says, that we need to um, explore um, further and get as much information as we can so that we can take it forward. And Daniel? I mean, obviously, we all need to be mindful <clears throat> that we have a legal duty to uphold the independence of the judiciary, but I actually think that uh, uh, transparency enhances independence, and I very much support the, the comments the colleagues have made, and I think this is something that we should take forward, and I think uh, exploratory work makes an awful lot of sense. Okay, and is it the committee's wish, therefore, that we keep this open and seek further information? Thank yes. you.
Okay, um, we now move to uh, petition PE163, Private Criminal Prosecutions in Scotland. Members have uh, a submission from the petitioner. And um, could I invite any comments or questions on this petition? Yes, Rona. Thank you, convener. Um, can I um, register an interest in this petition as the petitioner is a constituent of mine? Um, can I make highlight a couple of points from his submission, please? It's, it's a fairly complex issue, but I, I mean, I've just put some bullet points down to try and simplify it. The petitioner believes there's a clear gap in the law here, um, particularly in relation to the health and, so, uh, health and safety executive um, because a report must be produced by them before the Crown Office can act on any uh, criminal, private criminal prosecutions. Um, Health and Safety Executive has admitted in an FOI that sportsmen and women are treated differently from other employees and that the whole um, basis of this prosecution relies on a, on a, a pretty random process. And uh, he believes people should be able to make a report directly to the Crown Office after an incident, um, people themselves, rather than one of the various bodies who are entitled to do that, and he's listed it in his, his submission. Um, so I'd be in favour of, of keeping this open, getting more information uh, from the Lord Advocate, and perhaps inviting the petitioner to attend to give oral evidence. Are there any other comments? John Finney. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, health and safety is a very important matter for the trade union um, movement, and I, I don't know if, if the Petitions Committee received comment from them, but I'd certainly welcome their views and whether they feel there's, there's a gap in, in this particular matter. Good point. Uh, I had an interest in, in how the rest of the U UK dealt with this. It's referred to by the petitioner. Um, we seem to see it as a problem here, but the rest of the UK don't, so perhaps some more information on that. And at the same time, could we maybe reflect on the wording in the community, removing in the petition, removing the requirement that the Lord Advocate must first give permission before a private criminal prosecution can be met, commenced. And I think some suggest that a private prosecution go ahead, can go ahead without the concurrence of the Lord Advocate, although a high test of exceptional circumstances would need to be met before the High Court permits this. I think these are all issues that I would like to tease out and, yes. and bring it back yeah. to the committee. Are we agreed to do that for the reasons I've just stated? That's very helpful. That um, concludes our uh, consideration of petitions, and we now move into private se session. Our next meeting will be on the 2nd of October, when we will continue with our post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012, and also hear evidence as part of our pre-budget scrutiny. We move into private session.